How's everybody doing? All right, uh, my name is Stephen Nibby. I am the uh, one of the bioinformatics specialists here at Green Genetic Center. I've been here since uh, 2010, helping design and implement our next generation sequencing pipeline. I work mostly on our exomes currently, with, along with my team, on some other uh, different types of ventures, panels, and um, other types of analyses, which we'll talk about here in a little while. I also collaborate or work with some of our collaborators in the computing realm, uh, such as Clemson and some of the cloud service providers which we're currently investigating. Um, our talk, my talk today is titled uh, Excel to Exascale. Has anybody, has anybody ever heard the term Exascale before? Maybe a few. Okay, we'll cover that. Um, everybody's heard of Excel, right? <laughs> okay. So that's where we'll start. This is kind of a journey of Greenwood from uh, spreadsheets to supercomputers. Okay. So quick definitions, Excel, you guys know what that is, spreadsheet software that commonly comes with Microsoft Office, uh, kind of a staple in uh, most data analysis. It's kind of an easy way to, well, it's an easy way to throw some data down and do some number crunching. Uh, Exascale is more of a milestone in computing. This has to do with uh, the capability of performing 10 to the 18th flops or exaflops. We'll get there later too. <laughs> All right, so I still have what a flop. What was a flop? Yeah. Oh, we'll get there. <laughs> <laughs> this is the journey from from Excel. I thought what you basketball players do. Oh, oh. <laughs> I think that do. I don't. It doesn't affect me. <laughs> um, so Excel, uh, you guys, you guys, pretty familiar with it. I believe there's actually a class being taught currently that's about to go on to Kevin. Uh, so that's that's nice. Uh, it's formula enabled. Uh, there are many predefined functions, arithmetic, statistical, straight comparisons, and even logic statements. It's visual basic enabled as well. Uh, you can also implement macros and drag featuring. So this is kind of an example. I'm not going to use the mouse, but uh, if you look over here to the right, I have six columns uh, with five values in each row. Each column is a formula specific to the number in it. So the first column is the number squared, the second is the number cubed, the third is the number times pi, fourth is a formula for entering the month, and the fifth is the probability that you will roll that many heads, I mean, that you will flip a coin that many times and it'll land on heads. I'm sorry, that's the probability you'll flip a coin twice and it will land on heads all the time, or once, twice, three, five. And then uh, color coding the cell that I kind of wrote, wrote a macro for to. Um, actually color code all the even. So if I had started here and dragged down, it'll actually autofill all these values with each one of these. So it's kind of a nice feature to kind of get a lot of data represented fast with formulas. So you can see kind of the values on the right side, the probability of rolling five head or flipping a coin in the five head in the row is one out of 32. And you can see the color coded columns as well. So that's just some of the basic features uh, that, you can through, that you can do with Excel. It's kind of been a, um, the unsung hero of Excel. Um, there was a paper written in 2000 or an article in 2001 called Biology Statistics Made Simple Using Excel. Um, it kind of described Excel as the, uh, a way to kind of do biology, do statistics and biology without actually having to have a degree. Um, Visualization is going to be created on the fly. It was uh, many different types of statistical tests were built in and easy to use, and it became kind of a quick access to powerful tools that are commonly. Uh, that commonly you would you would get out of some of the more expensive statistical packages such as the Metal and SPSS by being the last decade. Um, and the paper actually even goes into uh, additional detail as to which test you should perform based on flowchart for biologists uh, at the time. So it's really kind of a nice read if you ever want to kind of get into the realm of like it's it's an easy go-to if you don't know a terrible amount about statistics. Um, however, Fast forward 15 years, well, 17 years now, and um, the, this, we, we start to understand that maybe there are some actual problems coming with Excel as far as, as we approach big data. Uh, a paper that came out in 2015 looked at 3,200 papers across 18 journals and found that one in five of the next papers had errors in specific to the auto formatting problems with, uh, that come with Excel. So if you look at these three examples, this, uh, we've actually encountered this in our own. Step two gene becomes an auto format of date, so does March one. Genes, both of those are pretty ubiquitous in the literature as far like as the, as uh, being auto formatted. So what they did was they looked at the supplementary materials for all of these and found these genes in about twenty percent. And the chart to the right shows the supplementary files kind of increase as as time goes on. Particularly during the twenty fifteen. Um, 
So actually one of the biggest, so 20% was the average of supplement uh, genetics papers uh, across each of the um, each of the journals. The biggest the biggest one was Nature. They had about 34% of their papers were actually had this kind of cell-based error in supplementary material materials. So it's creating a little bit of problems now that uh, Excel is being so used in the field. Um, additional problems. So these can kind of be things that we've kind of experienced a little bit. It seems like a lot of Excel files are used for scratch work um, and maybe kind of a lack of standardization. They're just, they're just so many of them that are kind of just thrown down, save maybe on the network or wherever, and not really necessarily standardized. They're also pretty challenging to mine for info. So, I mean, it's a format that's kind of a proprietary. Um, an XLSX file is actually kind of just approached from the command line as binary. So you kind of have to know how to convert some other uh, command separated format or tab separated. It's challenging. Um, and because it's so hard to mine, it's also hard to, uh, to automate. So we see that um, a lot of times files are either forgotten or needlessly copied. So we created actually with the help of one of our, um, of one of our staff, um, KK, he helped us create like a, um, it's, it's a software that kind of comes the network looking for these files. Well, different types of files that we, we uh, look for. So we sent it out on a network looking for Excel file and found that there was 74,500 <laughs> in the network across these four, these four uh, drives. So um, 977 of those are actually duplicated. So we actually searched for the term copy. So when, when you save an Excel file, it's exactly the same, in the same directory, the same name, it'll actually just append a dash copy. Dot .xlsx to the file. So we actually have a thousand of those that are that are uh, needlessly copied in that way. So maybe it's something that a little bit of like clean one day approach. You know. <laughs> and that's not necessarily saying um, Excel is bad. Um, it's still used in our pipelines, to be honest. Uh, so if you look at the top, uh, this, this, this took me back to when I started. This was in 2010. Uh, first report I sent my when we were looking at the solid three uh, uh, data for some of, for some of our examples uh, with uh, coverage percentages at the top. And then we still use some of that reporting today when we're looking at copy number variations um, and some of our conditions across uh, several of our lines. Um, we have evolved kind of beyond that again. At the top, you kind of see pathogenic mutations that we did in 2010. We now incorporate a whole different variety of visualizations and uh, other types of filtering software, such as Cartagenia on, um, on their on mobile online. But so it allows us to kind of use VCF files in a much larger way. If you look at the top graph, there's actually three of those mutations are in every single sample. So that's not really informative. So why, you know, it's, it's there's a whole, the top one is, is embarrassing just for the fact of like presenting data to, to someone else. Like, hey, I've seen okay, so um, that, that information, so when I started in 2010, we were doing mostly just kind of like panels, uh, panel information. We had just kind of moved, after purchasing an next-gen sequencer, we had kind of moved into the realm of uh, sequencing whole different panels, the XLID gene, CBG, autism, et cetera. And then in 2014, we kind of moved into the exome realm, and the information kind of took off from there. So real quick, I want to kind of summarize what our exome sequence pipeline looks like. Um, so really, uh, after the bench work in the library prep in the lab, uh, most the, the a run of say typically three families or nine barcoded exomes is run on the SE. Uh, that information is transferred directly to a Linux cluster on site here in the building, actually upstairs, uh, where we implement a, a few of our scripts and kind of demultiplex them to thousands of files that that this that the machine puts off, and we demultiplex them into nine samples into eighteen files total. So. Um, once we do that, we remove all different kind of poor, all poor quality reads from these files, and then we align them to the reference gene. I'm currently we're using reference 37.8.13. Uh, After alignment, we perform variant calling with the third party software. Sorry, so there's a lot of P's in my, uh, <laughs> in my presentation. So I'll try and kind of pull back the mic right here. Um, so we also, uh, uh, after, after we do variant calling, that's kind of where we upload most of our information to Cartagena for, um, I guess, director review. There will be a lot of, uh, in director review, fellows review, basically anyone who wants to explore the data through a flowchart type, of, uh, for a flowchart type um, uh, system. 
So uh, once we do that, we also perform statistics on the coverage of our samples and to arrive at C and B calling and visualization is also done in R mostly um, it's because it's easy to automate. And then comprehensive reports are submitted to the directors and the rest of the team so that they can be uh, analyzed and determined maybe what causes of variance we have uh, in, the, in, the, in the family. So here's the raw data at the top. These are both from the command line. The BCL files come right off the machine. That is binary. That's what a uh, command line interprets as binary. It was just zeros and ones. Um, it's based BCL files are created by the Illumina sequencers. They're uh, easy. They're easy to update on the fly, and they're also easy to transfer over the internet. There are thousands of them per patient, and since it's broken up into a thousand pieces, it's easier to send a thousand files. And if one fails, you just stop, step back a little bit and send it again. So if a tiny little piece of a file, of, so if there's a thousand files, one of them fails, you just start that one back again and it takes no time. If you send two very massive files and one fails, you have to send the entire massive file from the beginning. So it's easier to break it up into a thousand pieces and send a thousand transfers, uh, so to speak. So once we uh, have those BCL files again, we e multiply, send you the fast few files, which you see at the bottom. Is usually every read has a four name uh, format where the read name and metadata metadata is at the top, and then followed by the sequence, uh, optional comments, and then an ASCII quality score at the bottom. Once we uh, find our fast data, once we have our fast data files removed for uh, all the different quality from the fast few files, we use Next Gene, which is our third party GUI based alignment software in Windows. There's an example of what you see at the top. Uh, I'm sorry, here's an example of what one of our alignments looks like. Uh, close up, a variant is called in the alignments if a read depth at position is greater than or equal to 3x coverage and at least 12% higher than the frequency. So, real quick, when I say coverage, if you look right there, right, that is six, no, I'm sorry, that is 18, I believe, 18 nucleotides in that position right there. 66% of them are highlighted because they are varying against the reference. The other three are in line with the reference. So 33% in line with the reference for this sample uh, at the NOL 9G for this position and 66 variant. So we could determine, that's usually kind of a determination that this uh, patient's heterozygous for this change. Um, so again, here's a more up close look at what, what one of these looks like. So reference amino acid at the top, followed by the call amino acid. You can see this is a uh, arginine and tryptophan, um, followed by uh, reference nucleotides and call nucleotides, not highlighted codon, kind of show what it looks like. So this is in the forward direction. And um, CC, CCG and CCA uh, is in the upper Yeah, so that, that's, that's in reference to the codons that you see at the top. Um, so once we do that, we can actually look at different types of variant assessments. On the left, you can actually see uh, mutations which are in trans. Um, so there are two variants close together in the uh, gene. One of them appears to be on, they, they rarely appear to be on the same on the same read. And actually, none of them are. This looks that way. However, this is actually an end in the gene junction. Uh, so none of them appear, they're always on separate reads. So what this typically means is that maybe one was inherited from one parent and it was inherited from another parent. How does this interact together and is this descriptive of the disorder of education? That's something that's um, interesting to uh, kind of report. And then you see um, side by side variants uh, on the same reads and then the same to the right. So we can also take a look at how uh, our trio analyses where we see variants in uh, both the parents and the program heterozygous parents for a uh, mutation uh, resulting in a homozygous variant for the protein. Uh, with that descriptive phenotype is something we, we do in our uh, trio analyses in Cartagena when um, we submit these for director review. So there's a lot of information we can kind of glean from all of this, uh, all the data that we're creating. We can also take a look at copy number variation, how this is uh, determined now. What we'll do is we have the average depth coverage for every single CDS region or exon. Uh, in the in the genome for a patient, so we we look at a um, we look at a patient and all of their exons, and we we determine what their coverage is, average coverage for every single base pair in that region, and then we keep a database of all that information. So we have all two thousand three hundred something uh, patients in a database. We only use five hundred of the um, normal samples to kind of use for comparison. 
So if we have a distribution for every exon, there is a distribution of average coverage, a normal distribution. A new patient is compared to this, and if for each exon they fall outside of two standard deviations, two point three standard deviations above, then it becomes it's considered a duplicated region, and if it's below, it's a deleted region. We look at how many of those are contiguous and determine the large scale copy number variations, uh, kind of determine how much of a region is deleted or duplicated um, in, in a patient. So here's some examples. Each one of these uh, vertical lines represents a, um, can you see that okay? At the bottom one, there's a red line. Okay. Each one of these vertical lines represents the standard deviations that this patient is away from the normal. So if it was all zero on the bottom line, it would be right in line with the 500 normal of the population. So in the top, in each one of these, we have a red outline box. And what this refers to are those thresholds. We're looking at the top left one. We see that there is a 16 CDS deletion in the NPHP1 gene on chromosome two. Similarly, well, uh, on the right side, we have a one CDS region duplication on CDS8, uh, the PKD1 gene, uh, gene in chromosome 16. So it's really these boxes, these visualizations, which are all determined on the command line, visualizing the R, allows to kind of say, determine which CDS regions might be informative or causative. If you, if you actually look at the bottom, there is an entire chromosome 21 duplication shown in this patient. I think we can all understand it is indicative of a trisomy 21 or Down syndrome. This is what it would look like in a sequencing of the patient, which we verified after the fact. Okay. So um, that's mostly what our pipeline entails. Uh, we have, there, are, there are associated other uh, reports that we, that we provide and visualization is just kind of on site. Um, so here's kind of a graph of what we done in the last, uh, I guess, since the end of 2014. Each one of these dots it represents how many samples we did per month in the last uh, three, three and a half years. Um, and then I, I put a smoothing curve on, uh, on there as well. So it's pretty variable like how many uh, samples we get per month. And there starts to, it starts to decline a little bit because now we're starting to get more, um, more requests for panels and different types of focus exons. So the average coverage per month across this entire distribution is roughly 50.6 samples per month that we see in exons. So that's something to kind of think of. Um, we kind of use that number to kind of extrapolate how many genomes maybe per month, you know, is, will it be 50.6, will it be half that? It's kind of a way we can kind of guess what our needs will be in five, 10 years. Okay, so um, what we have here is kind of a raw data explosion. So in looking at 1995 and Kind of estimating what will happen up through 2022. Here's kind of a average raw data size per sample. This is fast Q files. This is we look at Sanger and that pretty much doesn't register. Those files are tiny, and there's so many of them. Um, so we don't really have to kind of look at that. Next gen panels. When I started, kind of a blip per sample. I would say maybe like 40 to 50. No, I'd say less than that. I'd say 20 gigabytes. And then exomes we get upwards of like 100 to 100 to like 120 um, gigabytes in size per file. Genomes that goes up dramatically, so we start getting the 400 range per raw per raw data per sample that we see, um, and then TGEM. It's those two curves are very sporadic because we we took a lot of liberties with what that's gonna um what that's gonna look like. We're starting so at 400 gigabyte per genome per sample raw. Yeah, yeah, uncompressed per person. Per person. Yeah, that's uncompressed. That includes a roughly 260 gigabyte like read file. And then like a hundred ish gigabyte alignment file, BAM files. And then TGEM is at least double that because Genomes is in there and RNA seq as well, and all the other uh, softwares or, tools, or all the other technologies we've been talking about. Again, that was a complete estimation, like a speculation of the TGEM model. We'll explain why. So we look at where we are now, we're right at that little, like kind of climbing that curve. Okay, so we we're getting to the genome level, but it's really a you know, becoming almost an order of magnitude increase in the amount of data that we have that we'll be generating for um, So that was, uh, let me go back, that was raw data. We look at compressed data. So when I say raw data, like the data we have ready to be computed on right there at that moment. When we compress it, it's for storage. We kind of reduce it to approximately an eighth to a quarter size um, just to kind of keep it somewhere and not take up too much of the footprint on, in, our, in our storage. 
So we look at uh, data that we've had in, over the past, uh, you know, since 1995. There's uh, 20 terabytes of non-sequencing data that has been created over the 20 past 23 years, including images, uh, different types of documents, other other uh, things, maybe on images. Uh, Next-gen panel over the six-year period from approximately when I started. I should actually say 2010, 2015. Sorry. Um, is I would say probably about 11 terabytes. And so we got into exomes. In three years, we generated 89 terabytes of information uh, over the past three years. Genomes, we can project probably about six terabytes per month. So that's 6,000 gigabytes per month. Um, and TGM 13. So how do we get there? How do we manage this level of data that we're generating, uh, that we're generating pretty dramatically uh, or very, very fast? And that's just storage too. That's not that's not completely like in action data. That's data that we have stored somewhere, which we'll kind of look at later when we do uh, make data mining on. Um, so if we wanted to kind of do genome alignment in house, again we just mentioned these numbers. Uh, genome file size per sample: 250 to 300 gigabytes, and BAM file at 30 x genome would be probably around 80 to 90 gigabytes. Um, the storage footprint compressed is 125 gigabytes for com computing all of that information. A one, it's easy to say we can just say one trio per terabyte. If we compress all that information and store it for later, nine samples per terabyte, three trios, three families per terabyte that we can have of just genome information. Our current specs are on the right. We have a 32 compute core cluster and a 60. We use the 61 for our exome alignment. Um, and we have approximately 150 terabytes of space stored in storage area networks. Um, nine exomes typically takes um, upper bound of about a day. So three families we can get done in a day after it comes off the machine. If midnight oil. Um, data that has been coming from one of so we had we had sent off uh, sequencing for approximately 150 samples, genome samples, and that in, that entails probably about 30 to 40 terabytes of raw data information that we're receiving uh, from MNG, uh, so 250 gigabytes per sample. The turnaround time we're using our current pipeline is about a week per trio in-house. Uh, we've tested that on some Coriel data on base, so that's, that's pretty bad. Um, and well, just under a year, we're doing all of that information, just the trio, just the genomes that we've uh, kind of learned, you know, very, very, I guess, uh, mess around with. So, uh, looking further, even into uh, TGM, we have. Um, so let, let me go back and say, one year is too much time. <laughs> okay, <laughs> that is so much time for just you know uh, that for that many what, what's that for forty five uh, families. I'm sorry, fifty families. That's just not that's just not not happening. So if we look even further into TGM, uh, into the TGM, this is kind of an abbreviation for technology and genomics enhancing medicine. It incorporates all the different. Uh, kind of emerging techniques and technology that are happening, whole genome sequencing, array testing, RNA-seq, metabolomics, proteomics, clinical artificial intelligence, bio-nano. Um, again, we're projecting data volume of about 13 terabytes per month. Uh, the whole goal for implementing TGM would be to kind of improve the diagnostic rate using these new technologies. Instead of kind of having a summary of a trio from the genetic sequencing side of things, you can have maybe a, a 30 page report Incorporating all of these different technologies that are uh, long term, incorporating all of these different technologies that might give an accurate profile of family or location. It's um, it's using all of the emerging technologies to kind of find the answer. Let's improve our diagnostic rate. And um, you better throw in more of that clinical AI there. <laughs> yeah. You're giving me a 30 page. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> Those reports are cool. I don't know if you've ever seen some of the Watson. Variant annotation stuff. You can actually submit a list of variants to Watson, and it'll actually report back um, kind of extensive summaries of what these, what these things look like. It's, it's weird. Um, it costs money too. Don't think that's something to do. Just kind of when you get out of here. Um, so again, projected data volume roughly 13 terabytes per month. Uh, also huge, much bigger than genomes um, by a factor of two at least. Um, and again, this will require high performance computing and and space. So we have no choice but to kind of move into cloud in the cloud space. We can do this in, I'm not saying we have no choice, we can do this here at the center, but it's time to get out of the business of making clusters, I think. It's just so it's so cost prohibitive to actually manage and create 
compute clusters that are this size that need to handle this amount of information. Um, there have been several times where we bottlenecked at the computing side of things, uh, such as when we did exomes or data volume um, just blew up. Uh, we're actually operating at almost 92% capacity storage right now. So what we have, we're reaching the limit and we're exploring these types of uh, tech, these types of solutions. So these uh, cloud cloud service providers are fairly inexpensive. You can kind of some of them offer pay-as-you-go storage and power. Um, Google Cloud, Microsoft Azure, IBM Cloud, Amazon Web Services. Uh, Illumina also has their own cloud uh, database space that you can use. I think they're starting to uh, incorporate just uploading raw data and, and uh, implementing entire BIOS around this pipeline. Um, so what this enables, data redundancy twice. It's a joke, kind of bad. <laughs> <laughs> not, not a very good one. Um, it also allows for uh, deep learning and artificial intelligence development. Not only that, but it's virtualized. So it's not really has to, it doesn't have to be here on campus. We can actually just kind of access it via a browser or some of the type of interface. Um, and of course, some of some of the uh, some of these clouds offer the digitization of our legacy data. So we have various um, images from stretching back to the '70s. We can digitize all of that and actually annotate some of that to make it mineable. So you have handwritten doctor's notes, maybe from 1980, whatever. Um, there are actually op options in Amazon and Google that allow the scanning of that document and using natural language processing can turn that into a text file that you can mine for information later on. And they offer these services. Um, for, for money, you know. um, but it's but it's it's nice to know that you don't have to have somebody sit down in the basement looking through the file and typing your file. There are, there are options to kind of get around that. Um, and in several of the cases, they are HIPAA compliant. Um, Amazon wasn't in the beginning when we started offering their cloud services, but they are they are now. Um, and Google has security measures to keep it HIPAA uh, that they can explore. Um, and again, this, this enables kind of machine learning on all of our data in a much larger scale, as opposed to how, we're, um, how we uh, can deal with it now. So our data, as, we, as it sits now in the basement, is, um, uh, of the other building, is uh, fairly structured. I wouldn't say it's structured like we want it to be structured. We want relational database tables, different types of ways where we can ask the, the right questions. How many patients have this disorder, or how many patients were from this part of the part of the state are under 35 and have two changes in their um, like <laughs> maybe two genes or something. So those types of questions take investigation, like take an almost a day's amount of investigation now. But however, if we can structure that in the cloud or in a learning or in a relational database, then we can instantaneously have those answers. Uh, who knows what machine learning is before I go there? Anybody? That's one. <laughs> That's two. Lori, you raised your hand. You went look at it, right? Um, <laughs> sorry. All right, machine learning is when, when people say artificial intelligence, it's kind of a scary term a lot. Okay, so machine learning is kind of the first stage of that. How do we learn from machines? These techniques have been around for quite some time. Um, it wasn't until about the 90s where computers started to actually getting powerful and be able to handle this. So deep learning has been known, deep learning techniques are the buzzwords of today. Uh, kind of a deep learning revolution that's going on right now it was started in the uh, I believe late 70s or early 80s. That that technique has been around forever, but nobody could do it until the computers are strong enough. And now computers are very strong, and they are on your phone. Deep learning is on your phone. It is in quite a quite a different uh, quite a lot of industry as well. So machine learning is a computing technique where information is fed into a machine, and the machine through different mathematical relationships will develop. Um, Will determine it will learn from that and improve, use that information there kind of improve system performance. So common examples, um, I've used this slide before. You see, I'm sorry. Um, common examples of machine learning, Amazon recommendation systems. If you've ever asked for a book, looked for a book, bought a book, you're gonna get hit up by Amazon's recommendation systems almost in your email or time you go there. They know and they're learning, they're learning what their uh, what their customer base uh, reads and what they like to read. If you've read this and you like this, you'll buy this. Um, it's ubiquitous. Machine learning is ubiquitous in kind of recommendation software. Um, check reading in ATMs, you enter a check in the ATM and knows what you wrote. The power behind that, yeah, yeah, so that, that blows my mind that that, 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 that that exists. Okay. I know it's taken for granted now, but. It, there was a lot of research that had gone on the fact that you're like 
like I write, I write terribly. Um, but if I had written a check out, it somehow knows and can figure that out. So it's pretty amazing to watch. Um, anybody who goes to Vilo and has a grocery store bonus card, they're pretty much the reason it's free and the reason you get discounts is because you are the product. I hate to say it that way, but they are doing active machine learning on what you purchase. And I'm not saying they're doing that in a negative way. They're just trying to get you to um, to improve their store experience and, and to try and see what maybe we'd like to buy. A lot of the times, um, ever since the store bonus card thing started happening, we go back and look at the reports of how often grocery stores are rearranging their uh, their um, their products and you know parcels. So, if you ever go to Costco, my God, there's nothing's ever where you want to go. <laughs> it is absolutely like chaos every time you go there, except for the hot dog. Um, if anybody with an in inbox, you junk emails automatically determined that's through uh, machine learning. Uh, and colorizing historical photos, this one's kind of fun. Um, so here's an example at the bottom. There are through this, this, there's uh, several reasons why this is possible now. So it was kind of a challenge to do for machine learning for a long time. However, the explosion in photos that are online now are largely due to social media. The amount of photos that have been generated since the advent of Facebook is like magnitudes larger. The amount of photos that existed before Facebook. I mean, you can you can throw a pebble into into the state of Oregon. I think the state of Oregon, like the pebble, is the photos that are like that existed before Facebook, and then like Oregon is like Facebook. Now. <laughs> it's just there's so many photos that have been uploaded, not necessarily to Facebook, but it's I would imagine. So, um, what about in uh, medical informatics? So now, uh, one of the terms that's con commonly used in kind of the literature for, uh, I guess, medical informatics is hospital readmission rates. So now we can start predicting that. What can we say to kind of keep um, patients from having to come back due to errors that might happen uh, while during their treatment or any other types of issues? Um, how can we prevent them from coming back to the hospital? Let's, let's help help cure them. Uh, we can model risks of cancer and inferring protein structure. We can also identify more complex variant interactions. So think of it, I mean, it's, it's kind of getting away from that Mendelian model of just one gene, one, um, one gene, one variant, one gene, one disorder. Uh, now we can look at like how various networks of these genes play together, uh, what might be causing cancer or autism, these more complex disorders that are, that are huge um, challenges right now. Text mining and hypothesis generation is one. And now there, I think it's something like 20,000 or 2,000, 2 or 4,000 articles are submitted every day, I believe to most, to most uh, journals. So it's impossible to read. So that's something that we need some sort of like intuitive way to kind of find all these different, I mean, if you, if you submit a journal or an article to a journal, you're specialized in that field, you can essentially say that, um, but you're not specialized in all the fields. So what, how can we tie all the information, all the accumulation of human, human knowledge that's being published yearly, um, and that's being done through the deep learning techniques. There's quite interesting literature on it. Um, metabolic profile, meta metabolome profiling is also one that we're actually going to start trying to incorporate soon as um, metabolomics is coming more and more online, as well as drug uh, interaction detection. Excess scale computing. Okay. Um, it's kind of the we're approaching the end of our journey. Oh, okay. So in 2015, um, Obama signs, uh, President Obama signed an executive order to create the NSCI calling for the accelerated development of exascale systems. So this is kind of developed a broad set of modeling and simulation um, applications to kind of meet um, industry requirements for advancing scientific engineering and nuclear programs of the Department of Energy. So um, exascale is getting to a level where uh, what exascale means is that it'll be to the level of computations that you can kind of perform that'll allow you to simulate very complex situations. Um, so simulation is kind of something that shows up a lot when, you, when you're dealing with exascale computing. So um, by 2021, the first exascale computer, so it's not, it's not here yet. Uh, the first exascale computer is estimated to be here by 2021 and commonplace by 2023. So um, we'll deal with that in a bit. And they're incredibly hard to build. To, to build. The, um, there are a thousand fold increase in power from the petascale computers that were introduced in 2008. So it's taken us almost 10 years and it will take us another three to kind of get there, estimated. Um, and the, the amount of power that we will have uh, from this level of computing will transform uh, healthcare, astrophysics, climate science, and a great deal of industry. When quintillion flops, 
So 10 to the 18th law is powerful as 1 billion average lab costs. So what's a flaw? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody. <laughs> Oh, that's right. That's right. Okay. We're going to focus on um, loading point operations per second. Okay, that's really what we're looking at as a me measure. Um, you think about uh, computing performance. So back back in the, I remember I bought um, a computer. Well, my dad did. My dad bought a computer when I was a kid, and uh, then I made money. And it was measured in megahertz. The speed was in megahertz, which is one CPU. That was fascinating to me. I was like, okay. And then I got older and I actually had money for a computer and I was looking at megahertz and they were like, that doesn't matter. It's dual core, quad core, all this stuff starts coming online. Um, now it's kind of measured in flops. How many operations can your computer do per second? Because it doesn't really, in megahertz is less important than uh, when you get to this level of computing. So here's kind of the um, orders of magnitude of computing. Um, so if you look at Desi scale, 10 to the negative one, that's like you doing math. What's five times eight? It's 40. Okay, that's Desi scale computing. You did probably like a tenth of a second what five times eight is. If you were adding with pen and paper, that's one flop. That's about an average. Average. It takes you roughly a second to kind of uh, do one floating point operation. Um, and we can go up and up. So Giga scale is the iPad Pro from 2017. Uh, IBM Watson's uh, 80 teraflop, so it's on the tera scale. And the fastest computer today is the IBM Summit uh, as of June 15th, I think. Um, and it is capable of 122.3 petaflops. So that's one tenth of exascale. Okay, so we're still getting there. And that was a big thing. That was like, I think last year it was 93 from a group in Japan, and then uh, 93 petaflops. IBM spent loads of money and got a little bit like 30 extra petaflops, and they were like, oh my God, the world has changed. So, um, <laughs> so, so how big a run is this? There's no the scale of the computer. Do we even think about size that way since everything? Oh, well, so I'll show you the next slide. But it, this one right here, there's a really small door. Yeah, kind of see that, that door. Yeah, I'm pretty sure that's a truck loading door. I don't think that's like for a guy. <laughs> <laughs> um, so they're pretty big and they get hot. So you know that's one of the things is um, computing is is it requires energy. It's just, it's a very like Heat generating process, you need to be able to cool this kind of thing. So it's, it's incredibly hard to build for the fact that like we need new technology, we need to innovate how we do um, some of these things. Actually, you guys all know Dragon, right? From Edico Genomics, the Dragon processors. Anybody have heard of that? Okay, well, they were just bought by Luna and they had taken a, um, I believe it was an FPGU processing, kind of a graphics or well, gate um, processing unit. And it was a new and inventive technique, there's a new and inventive processor. Um, and they use that for alignments, and their alignments take record time. You know, so they're actually starting. You have to wait for the processors to actually um, advance in technology for you to be able to kind of exploit that kind of uh, technology. So, if you ever see Edico um, again, well, no, they're they're still around. I mean, obviously they're working, which is kind of looking a lot. So that was a big that was a big win, I guess, in our world. Um, when you get below, ex so exascale, we're still a tenth of the way there. Beyond that, as things start to get a little philosophical, so it's um, you start getting into like simulations that might actually really like bring about philosophical questions. So can we simulate a brain? Can we simulate everyone's brain? You know, like what can we do? Um, and what does that mean for um, like robot rights? Like we don't, we don't have to go into that here. <laughs> it's just a funny like it's a rabbit hole. It's really fun rabbit hole to kind of go down and start thinking. Okay, so here is kind of a model of one of the uh, proposed exascale machines. So in April 2018, the Department of Energy announced a request for proposals uh, worth up to 1.8 billion for development, two to three of these. Um, Aurora is the first one in development at the Argonne National Lab in Illinois. Um, they are, again, they're saying it's gonna be online by 2021. Uh, expected to have more than 50,000 nodes, the five petabytes of memory, and is projected to achieve the one exaflop milestone. By the way, uh, so if we go back, one exaflop, if every one of you, um, we, we, I read this, hold on, if every one of, every person in the world did one calculation per second, it would take four and a half years to equal one exaflop. 
Like this can do that many calculations per second. Okay. So four and a half years for everyone in the world to sit there and add on thick pencils of paper. Um, and then that would equal the fact. If one guy did it, it would be twice the age of the Okay. So <laughs> who's the excuse me person <laughs> who hangs up these things? <laughs> <laughs> oh, been there. Wait, that's that's like my little milli low. That's old that cool school. After we get down to Pennsylvania. Yeah. Don't. I'm sure it has somebody, somebody in physics or astronomy. You know, when you get to that level of uh, universal size, you know, this is pretty amazing. Yeah. I'm sure it goes beyond there. Like I don't know, I'm um, Yada. We yeah. definitely talk beyond the yeah, I was like, what that mean? That's, I wasn't gonna put that here. That's right. <laughs> so um, this will allow the extra scale machines will allow kind of a new breakthrough in science and uh, industry. Uh, modeling and simulation will be kind of a feature of that. We can simulate immense amounts of information situations. So that's really kind of the benefit of taking this amount of um, this approach to moving forward. So um, what extra scale applications kind of in the industry? We we'll look at three examples here. It will completely revolutionize climate science on the right. You can actually start simulating um, individualized particles and air currents, as well as fuel simulations. Um, and in the bottom left, there's the actual simulation. It took an amazing amount of time to do of a supernova emerging. So a lot of people want to think a supernova just kind of stands out with this like huge sphere, like kind of growing out the, the empty space. Actually, it's more like this. It's kind of a bulbous mass that just kind of explodes in a huge like popcorn like way. And that took that was like there were some cool papers that were published because of that uh, simulation. Um, so it's it's changing. Like this this isn't this wasn't done in an exascale the uh, supernova simulation, but we learned something before exascale about that. So what we learn once we get to that level is we're ten times faster um, in that realm. So it also will dramatically change uh, computational biology. So we can start thinking of like how to simulate a lot of these different metabolic processes or pathways. From the atomic level. So in 2005, the Los Alamos lab simulated 2.64 million atom ribosome motion. Um, and in 2017, the University of Illinois simulated 1.2 microseconds, I uh, misspelled that, uh, microseconds of the life of a 64 million atom HIV. So that's 1.2 microseconds. And that took um, probably about a month and a half to, to calculate and then actively visualize. So um, most modeling simulation will kind of only provide these local views of processes without having to do 1.2 microseconds. But what can we do if we had more computational power to be able to say, let's, let's watch this from the end and let's see how it affects the cell? Um, in the exascale era, simulation of these networks can be done in full scale model of eukaryotic cells within hours. We can start looking at different types of macro scale folding patterns. Um, modeling microevolutionary dynamics, multi species biological systems, which will be very important, maybe like in US science uh, and microbiomes. Um, we can also begin modeling environmental factors that might have uh, impacts on cellular development and start looking at um, maybe maybe impact on uh, how, how cancer cells are being acted or how, how the cells are being triggered into becoming cancer cells and becoming environmental factors. And that's just, there's so many other ones again. Um, when we start thinking about it in healthcare, most of the literature talks about cancer treatment. So getting a cancer diagnosis is uh, you know, absolutely devastating, of course. And um, the treatment is essentially time sensitive, especially this kind of malignant, uh, malignant tumor. Biopsies of single tumors can result in a dramatic amount of uh, measurements and the accumulation of this data has quickly outpaced the ability to actually analyze it. So we have all this information about it. What can we do? Let's, let's how do we um, come up with the correct diagnosis for that? There's enough measurements for it. So let's, how can we provide the fastest diagnosis with cancer as early as possible? Again, we move into the exascale era. Uh, we can start modeling drug combination response prediction, often requiring approximately around a billion drug combinations to find the best fits, the characteristics of the tumor, um, and maybe the environment uh, or surrounding the tumor. Uh, we can also start simulating the environmental factors of drug treatment mechanisms on tumor cells, in addition to going through um, for discovery of hypothetical billions of different hypothetical compounds uh, through exhaustive search and simulation. So we can kind of change the way we approach uh, 
cancer uh, treatment. This is a little bit more fringe, but it's still kind of uh, interesting what it, what it offers. So whole brain simulation is something that is starting to be looked at uh, kind of in a, in a very, there, there's quite a, quite a large field put to this. Um, so the density of the neurons in the synapses of the real brain is approximately 10 billion neurons to every square centimeter. So um, in 2009, IBM's cognitive computing uh, division utilizing 147,000 processors, 144 terabytes of memory, simulated 1 billion spiking neurons and 10 trillion individual learning synapses, and they barely reached the cerebral cortex. So that was, uh, two, that was 2009. That was 250 million brain cells. To do an entire brain, 86 billion, roughly 300 and something um, times times the cat, the cat yeah, 344 fold increase of the cat cerebral cortex would take um, Exascale level of simulation, actually probably even like ten exascale exascale loss. Such a complex um, situation, it's such a complex organism, uh, or organ brain uses virtually no energy in comparison to an exascale computer. Um, so how do we how do we actively uh, how do we accurately simulate that information? And also, what does that mean? I guess this is where it kind of gets on the philosophical level. You have a simulation for every neuron in the brain very detailed in how it interacts with its environment and itself, then is there some sort of emerging property, some sort of like emerging consciousness that might develop? Like where, where do we go from like you know, robot rights or you know, what, what do we do? So um, despite all that, preparing for this, um, there are definitely a lot of algorithms that are being developed in lieu or in preparation for exascale computing. In 2018, the frontier of neuroinformatics will a Algorithm for handling most of this data, establishing the networks for brain simulation was uh, provided. It doesn't simulate a brain in real time, but it does create a network highly efficiently. And the um, side effects of that were that it created a huge speed up uh, to existing brain simulations. So we're already getting there. We're already getting ready for it. We're trying to develop new algorithms for this type of uh, milestone in the computing, computing realm. So um, as we evolve towards the future of healthcare, um, again, we have our, uh, so we've gone from single gene to gene panels, exomes. I say right now we're in the omics profiling realm of things. We've, uh, we've done exomes. We're moving into the genomes now, as well as most of the TGEM, um, the TGEM landscape. Uh, deep learning techniques will be implemented. Beyond that, we start getting into uh, kind of learning healthcare systems like um, uh, artificially intelligent clinical decisions for systems biology, pharmacogenomics. You guys put pharmacogenomics in this profile as well as microbiome, but it will be dramatically uh, improved upon as we get into the exascale era. And then again, simulation driven treatment. So deep learning is a big thing right now, but simulation of an actual environment, such as like the metabolic pathway in the eukaryotic cell, um, or in a you know any any kind of cell, is something that is um, you know what kind of results can we observe from doing that? We don't have to really sit there and speculate with deep learning. Look at the results and try and guess what it is based on the deep learning techniques. We can actually simulate. So that's one of the promises that are coming uh, with. Well, that's one of the promises that are being given with uh, kind of the advent of exascale computing. So I mean, that's that's kind of essentially where we've gone from from the beginning, where I started in Excel, uh, all the way up through kind of brain simulation. You know, so it's kind of it, there's a whole. Landscape. I'm not saying we're getting to the exascale area yet here at the genetic center. However, once it does come, it will dramatically change the face of research. And that's something that I think we'll just kind of get lost to witness before we start preparing ourselves for that. If you guys would like to read the additional materials, um, there's a great book called Swarm Intelligence from James Kennedy. It deals with a lot of divergent properties. Um, it relates all the way from anthills to super galactic clusters to even metabolic pathways and interactions in the cells. Really interesting to read. Um, Personalized and precision medicine is kind of more of like a like an accessible um, way. It's, it's an accessible read for. Uh, it's very low on technical terms. It actually, kind of helped me understand this a lot when I started focusing on this field. Um, it's it's really easy to read, and I would recommend it. it. It's pretty much a pick up and read over the weekend kind of kind of book. Um, the singularity is near by Ray Kurzweil. That's just kind of if you really want to go into the realm of what they. Have. Um, he has a lot of. Uh, thought experiments as to what, what AI looks like maybe in the future. And then in Quince Kassad, um, any of these topics that I've talked about today, well, most of them are 
easily uh, showing three minute animations on YouTube channel. I, I just recommend that channel because it's great, it's fun. <laughs> All right. Um, so if you guys, uh, oh, I guess real quick, the color off on it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. 